on World News Tonight. Weather woes. From typhoons to earthquakes, countries across the globe suffer the consequences of natural disasters. Flee or surrender. Ukraine goes on the offensive approach this time as its forces continue to hold on to regain territory. Monarchical malady. Indigenous groups and First Nations people voice their opposition to the crown, remembering their oppressive past. And time to tango. The World Tango Competition sees some of its best performances yet. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We're starting off tonight's broadcast from Mother Nature's destructive attempts. Torrential rains and dangerously powerful gusts of wind marked the landfall of Typhoon Namadol in southern Japan. The typhoon caused a mass evacuation of thousands in danger zones and the efforts continue as it moves across the country. Struggling through torrential rain and high winds. Residents here in Kagoshima seek shelter from one of the biggest typhoons to ever strike Japan after Nanmadol made landfall close to the city. Some from out of town struggled to return home, with much of the region's transport services suspended. The country's weather agency issued a rare special alert for both Kagoshima and Miyazaki in southern Kyushu Island. A warning reserved for weather conditions seen just once in several decades. It forecast unprecedented wind and wave strength, warning of landslides and overflowing rivers. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida urged residents to be vigilant via Twitter following an emergency government meeting. Please stay away from dangerous places and evacuate if you feel even the slightest hint of danger. Authorities called on over 4 million residents to flee their homes and head to local shelters, while close to 100,000 households were without power soon after the typhoon hit. The storm is forecast to turn east passing over central Japan towards Tokyo in coming days before moving out to sea by Wednesday. The entirety of Taiwan felt the tremors following a 6.8 magnitude earthquake that left hundreds injured and even more stranded and in need of evacuation due to train derailments and landslides as well as building collapses. A 6.8 magnitude earthquake hit Taiwan on Sunday, according to the island's weather bureau. The tremor derailed a train, caused a shop to collapse and trapped hundreds on the mountain roads. The Weather Bureau said the epicenter was in Taitun County, which is a sparsely populated southeastern part of Taiwan. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, Sunday's quake reached a whopping 7.2 magnitude and a depth of around 10 kilometers. Taiwan's fire department have said nearly 150 people were injured. The Taiwan Railways Administration said six carriages came off the rails at Dongli Station after part of the platform canopy collapsed, but the fire department said there were no injuries. The Weather Bureau have added that the quake could be felt across Taiwan. Buildings shook in the capital, Taipei, and aftershocks have continued to jolt the island. Taiwan lies near the junction of two tectonic plates, meaning it is prone to earthquakes. Hurricane Fiona is tearing a path of destruction through the Caribbean, with the Dominican Republic being its latest victim, where thousands are stranded without essential supplies. Torrential rain and wind gusts up to 85 miles an hour battered the Dominican Republic on Monday as Hurricane Fiona made its way through the Caribbean. It made landfall overnight, leaving behind a path of destruction for residents to wake up to. It destroyed everything. Everything has been affected. It all has to be rebuilt. All this. The Category 1 hurricane battered Puerto Rico on Sunday, triggering a total power outage and killing at least one person. Up to 30 inches of rain was recorded in some areas, producing catastrophic flooding. Down trees and mudslides have cut off access to some roads, and many are without basic necessities. We're looking for gasoline, water, ice, all the supplies necessary for getting through this. We were hoping it wouldn't be so big, but well, it was bigger than we expected, and you have to make do with what you have. Fiona is now making its way north gathering strength as forecasters predict it will become a Category 3. 
Turks and Caicos Islands is under a hurricane warning, and the Bahamas is bracing for tropical storm conditions in the coming day. Indigenous people's voices are calling out against monarchical rule, demanding they get justice for their oppressed ancestors by demolishing a system they claim is archaic and untolerated in modern society. As millions bid their final farewells to Britain's Queen Elizabeth on Monday, First Nations communities in New Zealand and Australia are speaking out on their ties with the monarchy. Indigenous Australian Parliament member Lydia Thorpe took her oath of office last month with a gesture that made headlines around the world. I, Sovereign Lydia Thorpe, do solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare that I will be faithful and I bear true allegiance to the colonising Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Last week, Thorpe spoke up about the pain, suffering and marginalisation they endured under the thousand-year-old monarchy. So many of my people have been murdered by the system and the colonial regime here. I felt that I was kneeling to the murderer and that was the most uh, demoralising moment, apart from the last time I did it. With Queen Elizabeth's death, the debate on abolishing the monarchy and the question of moving to a republic is swelling in the public domain. The British monarch is still head of state in 14 Commonwealth realms. Clayton Simpson Pitt said Indigenous Australians are fed up with the monarchy. While they're mourning their queen, we're mourning our people. We're mourning our old people. Um, we've had enough and it is an insult to declare at the click of a finger a day of mourning on the 22nd of September. In New Zealand, the indigenous Maori account for almost a fifth of the country's five million strong population. However, they are overrepresented in prisons and state care. Debbie Nariwa Packer co-leads the political party Te Pari Maori. If we can't address the um, negativity and the impacts of colonization now, then when do we wait for Prince William or Prince William's children? The reality is no one alive doesn't understand the true impacts of colonization, the displacement it does to peoples. Previously, it was accepted. Now it's not. It's, dehuman it's dehumanizing and it needs to stop. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said she expects New Zealand to become a republic eventually. Australia's centre-left Labour Prime Minister Anthony Albanese also openly favours a republic. But any change would require a referendum and that is only expected if his government wins a second term. While some call out for the end of the crown, many stand silently in mourning. Several nations around the globe that have been historically connected to the monarch pay their respects to a leader that has shown the world a peaceful reign of seven decades. In the heart of Washington at dawn, an American farewell at the Queen Vic. British drinks, a fry-up. It felt oddly fitting. Faces reflecting the varying emotions of the moment, emotions which have been felt well beyond Britain. In today's society where people are always screaming and shouting at one another and misbehaving, I felt that she had the sort of manners that you wish everyone would have. Also, the sense of loyalty that she and her family had during the Second World War, you know, they could easily have left London or even left the UK totally, and they didn't, speaks to character. Sorry. On the other side of the world, it was early evening in Perth, Australia and at Government House in Canberra, in a nation where the royal attachment wavers. Here, they paused. In Hong Kong, where the balance of British identity and Chinese authority is shifting, they remembered their sovereign and the crown she represented. This was a moment accessible to all. On big screens or in their palms, it's thought the global audience has been as many as four billion people. In France, a Paris metro station named after her grandfather for Britain's support in World War I, renamed for the day. 
a reminder of history binding nations. And in the Nepalese hills at a Buddhist temple, a different culture, a different religion, but a reflection again of history's bound. The extraordinary Gurkha loyalty to the crown endures well beyond empire. Around the world, sometimes despite history, but so often because of it, she was, for so many, the focal figure. She was unifying just by being. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. President Zelensky gave Russian occupiers two very simple warnings. Flee or surrender. The counter-offensive launched by the country's forces continue to prove effective at holding Russia at bay as the tides turn in the conflict. Ukraine extended its hold on recently recaptured territory on Monday as troops marched farther east into the areas abandoned by Russia, paving the way for a potential assault on occupation forces in the Donbas region. President Volodymyr Zelensky vowed Ukraine would keep fighting to regain its territory. We are stabilizing the situation, holding our positions firmly, so strong that the occupiers are really panicking. We have warned that the Russian soldiers in Ukraine have only two options, to flee from our land or surrender. In a dramatic counteroffensive that has changed the tide of the war, Ukrainian forces swept through the Kharkiv region this month, sending thousands of Russian troops fleeing and abandoning their tanks and ammunition. The Ukrainian advance has slowed in recent days, but Zelensky said their forces were consolidating and preparing for further offenses. Ukraine accused Russian forces on Monday of shelling near the Pivdenukraisk nuclear power plant in the south. Zelensky released video footage of the explosion. Ukraine's state nuclear company said buildings were damaged, but its reactors were unscathed. The attack also damaged a nearby hydroelectric power plant and transmission lines. Since its forces were driven out of Kharkiv, Russia has repeatedly fired at power plants, water infrastructure and other civilian targets in what Ukraine says is retaliation for defeats on the ground. Moscow, which says it is engaging in a special military operation, denies deliberately targeting civilians. In the newly recaptured city of Izium, forensic experts carried out the grim task of exhuming bodies from a mass grave, most of them civilians. Sergei Bolvanov, the head of investigative police in the Kharkiv region, said some bodies showed signs of a violent death. As we can see, dead bodies of civilians and servicemen were buried without coffins. Because of that, the shape of the dead bodies is not good there are decomposed parts. During preliminary examination, it is hard to establish the entire list of damages done to the bodies. Zelensky has said some 450 bodies are believed to have been buried at the site in a forest on the outskirts of town. The Kremlin on Monday rejected allegations that Russian forces had committed war crimes in Ukraine's Kharkiv province, saying it was a lie. In a fresh wave of opposition against the ongoing Ukraine-Russia conflict, Poland, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania will now block Russian tourists with EU visas from visiting their country, claiming most Russian citizens agree with the ideals that caused the war. On Monday, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia and Poland brought in a ban on Russian nationals with tourist visas from entering their countries amid Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine. According to Lithuania's border control, 11 Russian citizens were already denied entry to the country. The state of Russia is unpredictable and aggressive. We see that three quarters of the Russian citizens support the actions of Russia in Ukraine. It's unacceptable that the Russian citizens who support the war can travel freely in the world, in Lithuania and the EU. It's also about security. There are security aspects about the decision. The support for the war could raise security threats for our state and the entire EU. The ban, however, will not apply to Russian diplomats or truck drivers. This man thinks that peaceful citizens of Russia have nothing to do with the situation in Ukraine. 
and feels like the decision is a wrong one. This Russian truck driver says it's a political thing. It does not affect me because I am a truck driver. Of course, our countries should be friendly to one another. Lithuania's ban will remain in force as long as there is a state of emergency at the border with Belarus and Russia. Europe is getting ready for the now seemingly inevitable winter energy crunch with drastic measures such as compensation for mandatory closure of energy-based sectors as well as better managing the intricate network of energy currently in force. Europe is racing to prepare for a winter energy crunch. Several governments set out new plans on Monday. Spain detailed measures that could force energy-intensive industries to shut at peak times with provision for compensation. France said it was preparing to send gas to Germany from October. Meanwhile, Berlin said it was still in talks over more aid for ailing utility firm Uniper. These are just the latest moves since Russia drastically scaled back gas supplies to Europe. Moscow says that's a result of maintenance issues with the key Nord Stream 1 pipeline. European governments say it's retaliation for Western sanctions and energy blackmail. Germany's economy is already contracting as a result. On Monday, the country's central bank said the contraction would get worse over the winter as gas consumption is cut or rationed. The same day, Vice-Chancellor Robert Harbeck said Berlin was working on getting new supplies from the UAE and elsewhere. The gas, the gas angebot, Gas offers are slowly expanding. The German government is constantly in talk with a lot of countries, also with the countries on the Arabian Peninsula. French regulators say they could start sending gas to Germany around October 10th to help out. Previously, the supplies had all flowed the other way, and the system wasn't set up to reverse. French energy group EDF is also racing to get nuclear reactors that are undergoing maintenance back online. But regulators say localised power cuts are still possible this winter. We have some good news for you. South Korea is leading the charge on the shift towards greener forecasts as the country's renewable energy output exceeded 20% for the first time ever. For the first time ever, the proportion of renewable energy generation facilities in South Korea has exceeded 20% while solar power, which contributes the highest share of renewable energy, exceeded 15 percent. Compared to 10 years ago, the share of renewable energy has increased four times, whereas the use of solar power has increased 19-fold over the same period. According to data from the Korea Power Exchange on Tuesday, the capacity of renewable energy generation facilities as of September this year was 27,103 megawatts. This accounts for 20.1% of all renewable energy production. Of other renewable energy sources, hydropower, bio, and wind energy made up 1.3% of capacity. Nuclear power made up 17.3%, a decrease of 25% from 10 years ago. Solar power saw the biggest jump of all, going from 0.8% of all renewable energy production to 15.1%. The growing number of renewable energy facilities in South Korea comes as the government continues to push toward a carbon-free society, while the decrease in nuclear energy production follows the previous Moon administration's drive to phase out nuclear energy in the country. However, while the number of renewable energy facilities has increased over the years, renewable energy production has not increased as much. With South Korea still relying heavily on fossil fuel energy, the government is continuing to push for more renewable energy usage throughout the country, providing incentives for companies that choose to follow a greener path. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A powerful earthquake struck western Mexico on the anniversary of two devastating temblors, killing at least one person, damaging buildings, knocking out power and sending residents of Mexico City scrambling outside for safety. Five people were killed in Iran's Kurdish region where security forces opened fire during protests over the death of a woman in police custody on a third day of turmoil over an incident that has ignited nationwide anger. 
The Taliban have released an American captive after two and a half years following a prisoner swap deal with the U.S. Navy veteran Mark Ferrich being exchanged for Bashir Nuzai, a tribal leader and early supporter of the Taliban movement. Palestinian youths clash with security forces on the Palestinian Authority after the Palestinian security forces detained two militants belonging to the rival Islamist group Hamas in Nablus. Sales of products made by overseas tech companies like Google and Apple in South Korea reached a 2.8 billion US dollars in 2021. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you have missed any of the stories tonight, you can rewatch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with the visuals of the World Tango Finals, where the creme de la creme of tango dancers shine with their moves and their outfits. Thank you for joining us. Good night.